this shout go up before? So good to see you all in the house of God today. I welcome our visitors. Uh, you might have done this last week, but I wasn't here, and my wife wouldn't let me watch. So I had to watch afterwards, but I just want to congratulate Jonathan and Shai again for their wedding. It was a great, great wedding, great, beautiful time to be there. Beautiful presence of God was there. We also had another wedding on uh, just a few days ago on Thursday. Another beautiful wedding. We'll congratulate them when we see them with Sabrina and Ben. My goodness, there's kind of a pandemic going around. Of... <laughs> Would you mind standing with me just for a moment as we go to one scripture? Please remember in prayer some of the I know that the uh, Addison Church is experiencing a lot of COVID right now. Keep them in your prayers. We, uh, we know that it's kind of hard to stop that thing from going around, but just pray that there won't be any complications from it and pray that they'll all recover and, and all be well. Uh, just don't forget them in prayer. Pray for anyone that you know. Remember the people that are about to experience that hurricane down there. This is a new, uh, this will be a new experience for the Goths. I looked at that thing, and it's, it's like hitting in New Orleans, and it's going around Bishop's house. And I said, Bishop, do you know you sent that up to the Goff's home? Up to, and, uh, <laughs> but it's going around Bishop, going around Wiggins, and then going right over the top of where the Goffs live. So, but by then, it'll be a tropical storm. Hopefully, hopefully, their home will withstand. We believe it will. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. And please do stay afterwards. We've got lots of food, and we're going to do our best to to grill for you, and, and we should have three or four grills going out there to make sure there's enough meat to go around. I know people brought a bunch of special things for today. We've got the, we're going to do it out front. We've got a canopy. We've got the uh, carport that we can get under if it happens to mist a little bit, but it's not supposed to rain till four, but we're believing that we'll just push it. We'll push it all down to New, or New Orleans, and, <laughs> and we'll have a nice sunny day up here. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6 in the King James. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Let me read it in the Amplified for you, unless they get it right away upstairs. Blessed, joyful, nourished by God's goodness. I like that. Joyful and nourished by God's goodness are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And it gives a definition. Those who actively seek right standing with God. Actively, not 25 years ago. Today, I am actively seeking right standing with God. For they will be completely satisfied. There's nothing left out. I love it when God has all these absolutes. He said you will be completely satisfied. I want to preach this morning on the subject... How's your appetite? How's your appetite? Would you put your Bibles down, lift your hands with me as we pray in the name of Jesus. We ask, O oh God, that you would bring enlightenment to us as we understand your word. Let it go forth with anointing. Let it accomplish that which you desire. We pray that those words would come into our good ground of our hearts and we would be able to respond to you. We ask you, Lord Jesus, that you would bless this mighty congregation. Lord, like you came up to Gideon, you said, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. Lord, we stand in front today of a mighty congregation of people that are full of faith and ready, O oh Lord, to take this world by storm, we pray in the name of Jesus. Look at your neighbor that you didn't come with and ask them, how is your appetite? And you may be seated. I realize that I'm the only one standing between you and all that meat. So I will do my best to get out of our way. Blessed, joyful, nourished by God's goodness are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who actively seek right standing with God, for they will be completely satisfied. When I was in prayer, I, that scripture came to my mind, and it was just amazing how many times I have read and heard that scripture, and yet... Two days ago, I was, I was thinking about it, and he said, I was thinking, blessed are those that, are, that hunger and thirst, they shall be filled. And God said, that's not what it says. 
And I'm like, wait a minute. Um, I went and looked it up, and he said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. He didn't say, are you hungry for a blessing? He didn't say, are you hungry for deliverance? He didn't say, are you thirsty for a miracle? He said, I want to know if you're hungering and thirsting after righteousness. He said, those are the people that will be completely satisfied. If you're seeking, that, that thing hit me so hard. If you're seeking pleasure, satisfaction from anything else in this world, it's not going to happen because he said only those people that hunger and thirst after a right standing with God, those are the people that will be completely satisfied. I looked up the word righteousness in the Greek and it's dekeosune. The keasune, Thayer's definition, Bible definition, it's a, it's a, a, a Bible dictionary. It's in a broad sense, it's the state of him who is as he ought to be. The state of him who is as he ought to be, righteousness, the condition that is acceptable to God. That's what righteousness is. We need to be actively pursuing the state that is approved of God, an attitude, a, the actions that are approved of God. And then the, uh, the, the sub-definition is the doctrine concerning the way, which was called, it was called, the, this apostolic doctrine is called the way in the New Testament, in which man may attain a state approved of God. So he's saying righteousness is also the doctrine concerning the way that a man becomes uh, it, it gets to a state that is approved of God. And 1B says integrity, virtue, purity of life, rightness, correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting. So when I broke all of that down, it really, the scripture that I opened with this morning, really means those that actively seek right standing with God will be completely satisfied and called blessed of God. I want to be blessed. Hey, uh, pastor, pray for me. I need a blessing. Good. Seek righteousness. You want to be blessed? Seek and hunger and thirst after righteousness. God said you'll be blessed. I, I can't. God will bless you. You know what? I can't really do that. The only thing I can do is say, you want to be blessed? Yeah. Then actively pursue right standing with God with a, in a hunger and thirsting manner. So when I read that, I, you know, we've all heard it before. Oh, you know, they're a little too conservative. It's a little tight. It's hard to live for God. I've heard it all. But according to the scripture, righteousness is not a burden. Righteousness is not a burden. Righteousness is a blessing. According to the word of God, it's not hard to live for God. It's a blessing to pursue living for God in a right and upstanding manner in a state that is approved unto God. Righteousness is a significant word in scripture. And one of the commentators said it basically has two meanings. And Really, it means conformity to God's law as opposed to sin, which is lawlessness. So it's conforming to God's law. Obviously, none of us are perfect, but there needs to be a hunger and thirst in our hearts to continue to conform to God's law. But the second part, and he broke it down, he said, righteousness has kind of a deeper meaning for those people that have come to God and have said, I want more of you. I want to be saved. I want to be in right standing with you. I want to pursue you. When I get up in the morning, let my hunger not be for eggs and bacon, but let it, let it be for the presence of God. Let it be for a stamp of approval from God on my life. Let it be for time in your presence. Let it be for time reading your word. Let it be, oh, that there would be perfect joy that comes from in your presence. In his presence is fullness of joy. Joy and at his right hand are pleasures and blessings forevermore. And he said, but when people turn to the gospel, we find that God justifies. Just as if it never happened. The ungodly who believe in him. 
So righteousness almost takes on a deeper meaning. In other words, when we figure it out, when we find out that God really wants us to approach Him and pursue Him, and then we come to an experience of being born again of water and spirit, righteousness then takes on a continued desire to, to conform to Him. I tell people all the time, hi, hi, uh, holiness is not a destination. Holiness is a highway according to the Word of God. A highway is not a destination. It is a place that we use to get from one place to another. The highway of holiness is a place that we get on and we stay on it as it leads us closer to God and ultimately through the pearly gates. Holiness is a place that we travel on to get there. There are things. It is a highway. It is not a degraded place across the tracks that people are to look down upon. It literally was a higher way to travel through the wilderness so that water and animals and people and robbers couldn't get to you. Holiness is a high way. So it's an awesome way to travel, but it takes us a deeper meaning. We say, Lord, I have been born again of water and spirit, and now I am living a life of righteousness. It is right things. In Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 10 in the King James, it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. Ooh, I want a, man, I want a new jacket. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. So righteousness is something God covers us with. So first of all, there needs to be a hungering and a thirsting after it. But when we begin to pursue it and we begin to conform to it, he gives us a robe of righteousness that he covers us with so that when he looks at us, he doesn't see our degradation. He doesn't see our righteousness as filthy rags, but we put on a new robe and he sees his righteousness upon us. And it says, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels we wear his robe of righteousness interestingly enough in Isaiah chapter 55 in verse 1 in the amplified everyone who thirsts say that's me come to the waters are you thirsty come to the water and you who have no money come Buy grain and eat. That sounds kind of strange to me. Everyone who has no money, you come and buy. How do you buy without money? Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. He didn't just say now without money. He said without cost. Well, have you ever been in a restaurant and forgot your credit card or something? I'll do dishes for a week for you if I to pay for my meal. He said, there is no cost. Without money and without cost, simply accept it as a gift from God. That means there are things that we can buy that will satisfy hunger and thirst that won't cost us anything. But then he goes on in verse 2 and he says, why do you spend money for that which is not bread? So it is absolutely possible to spend our money on things that are not bread. They won't give us sustenance. They won't give us nutrients. It simply are things, they are simply things that don't give us sustenance. And your earnings for what does not satisfy. So we can spend what God gives us on things that will not satisfy. He said, notice how we tie these together. He that, that hungereth and thirsteth after righteousness shall be completely satisfied. If we take what God gives us and we spend it on things that don't satisfy, he's saying, why are you doing that? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight in abundance. So there are needful things. Need, everyone say needful. needful. Things in the earth will never provide satisfaction, but I just read that, that seeking, hungering, and thirsting after righteousness will provide complete satisfaction. But there are needful things that we can buy, not with money, but with a hunger 
and thirsting after righteousness. You're hungering and thirsting. Yeah, but I, I left my wallet at home. It doesn't matter. Hungering and thirsting buys the things for you today that will completely give you satisfaction. I started studying that and I thought, God, there is so much stuff in here. We spend all of our life trying to satisfy ourselves with things that don't satisfy. And he said, the things that will satisfy don't cost you anything. Righteousness is not a burden. It's a blessing. John chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. Notice that. He kept using that analogy. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. If you come to him, you'll never hunger. And if you believe on him, you will never thirst. He's saying, if you want to be satisfied, then you need to come to him and you need to believe on him. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and have believed not. Verse 37, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. You and I don't have an excuse. Oh, you wouldn't want me to come into your church building. Those walls will fall right over. This says, him that cometh to me, I will not cast out. It's not too late for you. And it's not too late for me. If we have spent all of our energy, our time and our money and our passion on things that have not satisfied our soul, it's not too late. Jesus said, if we come to him, he will not cast us out. That's not what you and I would do. Well, I know what you did to me, and you're not welcome here. That's how, we, that's how we treat people. We treat people based upon what they've done or not done for us in the past. But Jesus says, it doesn't matter what you did to me. You could have shaken your fist in my face. You could have cursed me, Peter. But when you come back, by the way, Peter, I'll be waiting for you. So don't run. Don't give up. But realize that he will not cast you out. Verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me. Draw him. And I will raise him up the last day. He said you can't even. See think of this. There are people that come to him. And they're like. They act like. He's blessed. Because. And honored. Because I chose to come to him. He ought to be happy that I come. And give my life to him. And he said, Jesus said this, you can't even come to me unless the Spirit draws you. So when I pray, when I pray, thank you, Lord, for filling me with the Holy Ghost. Thank you for washing my sins away. But there's another part of that. Thank you for blessing my family. Thank you for doing all this stuff. But there's another part of that prayer that I pray. Lord, thank you. For even giving me a chance to repent. Thank you. For drawing me. There's a time in everyone's life. Time and chance happeneth to them all. And there is t there's a time. Where you'll be walking along the path of your life. And all of a sudden you feel this little pull. Now you can say. Leave me alone. Like I did 25 times. It was my brother pulling on, but it wasn't him. It was God. God was saying, I want a chance to talk to you. Just come here. And we can resist it if we want, but it will happen to you, and it might be happening to somebody right now. Yeah. Well, you're not talking to me. I've had the Holy Ghost 30 years. I am talking to you. Because there comes a time in our life when we, rem when we, we forget what he did. It is a blessing and a gift from God that he even pulled at our heart and said, would you come and serve me? We need to say, oh, thank you. Thank you for giving me a chance to live for God. <laughs> Verse 47, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. 
He said, they ate the things that were in this world physically and they died. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. There is something that we can partake of and we will never die. Oh, I know people that have been filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized and they died. You know what they did? They passed from this life to eternal life. They didn't die. They simply stopped here. They, 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 they were like in the Old Testament, Enoch. Enoch didn't die. Enoch simply was walking one day and stepped and his foot caught in the air. And he just went, whoosh, went right up. That's what's going to happen. If your heart stops beating here and you're filled with the Holy Ghost and you're living a righteous life, you don't stop living. You simply step into a new world. You step into a spiritual world. I'm not going to die. I'm simply changing addresses you won't find me you won't find me on Robin Lane in Wayne anymore because I won't be there my new address will be 111 Heaven Avenue I'm gonna be up there I'm telling you I'm not afraid of dying to live is Christ and to die is gain Revelation chapter 7, verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? He saw something that we haven't seen yet. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I want to take my filthy rags of righteousness and I want to wash them in the blood of the Lamb because it takes that which is dirty and makes it clean. Verse 15, therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them, watch this, they shall hunger no more. There's coming a day when we're not going to hunger anymore because we're going to receive our inheritance. Neither thirst anymore, neither shall the sunlight on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of water. Whew. I'm getting thirsty. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. What a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one that saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be blessed are those that hunger this describes a profound hunger that cannot be satisfied by a simple snack that's kind of how I eat most of the day walk past the island and whoosh, pick up something on the island and take it and go outside and do some work or head to the office or whatever. But it's a longing that endures and is never completely satisfied on this side of eternity. Because I, I always looked at that scripture and I thought, well, wait a minute. If, if we really do eat of him and drink of him, we should be satisfied. But what he's saying, but it's amazing how you can get up for prayer the next day and be like, you know what? I want to pray some more. I want some more of that. Does that mean you're hungry and thirsty? I just want more of him. It's kind of a hunger that you'll never hunger after anything else. But you keep hungering and thirsting after him because you can never exhaust. My experiences with him have gone deeper and wider and more incredible than the day that I received the Holy Ghost the first time. So there's more. There's more to understand. There's more to experience in the world. If, if you're a world traveler, there's still a lot of things you haven't seen. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, there's still a lot of spirit. 
There's a spiritual world that we can live in, that we can walk in and experience and experience on a daily basis more and more and more. We get the Holy Ghost, you're simply standing in the foyer of some mansion that God created for us. And he's saying, there's a lot of rooms. There's a lot of other mansions. There's a lot of other buildings I want you to explore. <laughs> Hunger and thirst for righteousness. We see Christians hungering for many things. Power, authority, success, comfort, happiness, entertainment. But how many actually hunger and thirst for righteousness? Are we hungering and thirsting for righteousness? This is hunger for complete righteousness, not just enough to soothe a guilty conscience. Our humanity wants to remove the guilt of yesterday, but go ahead and dive into some more tomorrow. But God said, I want you to hunger and thirst for righteousness to the extent that you will avoid the things in this world that bring the guilt upon you. For they shall be filled. This is a strange feeling that both satisfies us and keeps us longing for more. One commentator said, it was a Bible illustrator, he said, righteousness is a death unto sin, renunciation of the world, and a deliberate choice for God. Righteousness is not a burden. Righteousness is a blessing. Hallelujah. Personal purity. It also takes the form of doing right. Pastor Jans always said, righteousness are right actions. This object is a matter of desire. We need to desire. The desire, listen to this, the desire for righteousness is present more or less in everyone. When we do things right, we feel good about it. Even if it's the proverbial helping an old lady across the street. When you do it, you feel good about yourself. You don't do it and say, man, somebody else ought to help her get it. It's when we do something, there's something inside of us that says, that was a good thing. And when you make a move towards God, you feel good about it. I remember I came up here the first time and cried my eyes out. And when I got done, my eyes were all puffed up and you walk out of there going, man, that was good. People are like, what are you talking about? You look like you're allergic to 82 cats right now. You're... Your eyes are all puffed. You look like you're having an allergic reaction. You look like somebody pummeled you. You, look, you got caught by a gang in the back of the church and somebody beat the tar out of you. And you're like, man, I feel good. And you're like, what, what are you, what are you It just feels good. Why? Because that was a right action. See, when we do right things, something inside of you says, man, that was good. And then you obey the word of God in baptism in Jesus' name. And you get out of there and you're all wet. You look like a wet rat cr crawled out of a out of mucky waters and you get out and you go man I feel good and you always got this little smile on your face and you're like man it feels good man your hair's a mess I don't care what you think there's a new name written down in glory and it's mine oh yes it's mine I feel like singing today hallelujah scriptural attention is not drawn to possessing righteousness, but to the desire for it. They that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. He said, those that are pursuing it. So you look at it and you say, well, I'm not perfect like you are. God said, I don't care if you are because he's not perfect either. I just want to know if you want to be blessed in pursuing it. Are you pursuing it? <laughs> Hallelujah. The attaining. They shall have righteousness. We will have the robe of righteousness, the Bible said. The desire for righteousness is always met by the presence of sin. If you want it, you will have to deal with sin. If you really want a robe of righteousness, you're going to come face to face with that obstacle of sin. 
Because as you approach God, there will be things that he will ask of you, even demand of you. And you'll have to look at him and be like, I don't know. It's an obstacle for you and most likely for me. But it will be met with that. If you really want righteousness, there will be some things that you have to lay down and some things you have to pick up. Jesus died so that sin might be removed from our life. That was the whole purpose. It was that our record would be washed by the blood of the Lamb and that we would receive His Spirit to have the power to continue to live for Him. There's no sense. Pastor Jans always, before he would baptize somebody, he would always look at them square in the eye. You going to do your best to live for God? They're like... <laughs> and they looked at him and they were like, what does that mean? He said, well, you better find out. He said, there's no... Now, this was his words. He said, it doesn't help to give a pig a bath. Now, I'm not calling you a pig. What he was saying is, you grab a pig off of the farm, and it really stinks. It's got mud and slop and everything all over it. You take it, you put it in the baptistry, and you set it free, and it runs right back to the farm and starts digging around in the mud again. He said, if that's what you're going to do, I'm not baptizing you because it won't help. But if you want to be righteous, if you want to live for God, I'll wash away your sins in that watery tank right now and you'll be clean. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. Hallelujah. The desire for righteousness is also hindered by the moral feebleness of our nature. Your and my nature is weak. You can be doing your best day. And all of a sudden you wake up and your flesh says, come here. It's feeble. But if you get up and you say, hold that thought, flesh. You just wait a minute. I'm going to go to the altar first. And when you go to the altar and the living water starts pouring out of your soul, you come back to the flesh and you say, get back in that box. What box? The coffin I put you in when I got buried in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And I'll see you again tomorrow. <laughs> Pray every day. Why? Because that guy won't stay in the coffin. He'll beat his way out and he'll be there to meet you when you get out of bed in the morning. You say, you and me, we're going to the altar again and pray. That's the only way we win. God on the day of Pentecost made his spirit available to help us overcome that feeble, weak need spirit that we were born with. All you guys do is preach about the Holy Ghost. Oh my goodness. I can't live for him on my own. You all know what I was. I've given my testimony a thousand times. You know who I was. You know how I lived before I had the Holy Ghost. I've had people look me in the eye and say, oh, that Holy Ghost, that's of the devil. I said, that absolutely makes no sense to me. How could that be of the devil? So you mean the devil wants me to stop doing drugs? The devil wants me to stop cursing and swearing and telling dirty stories and sleeping around you. The devil wants me to stop doing drugs and dealing drugs. The devil wants... The devil doesn't want me to stop doing that. If the devil wanted me to do that, he already had me. But the Holy Ghost in me said, no, 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 no. And I said, yes, I have the power. <laughs> Hallelujah. He who would have the blessing promised in the text must want righteousness as a hungry man wants food. It's almost 11 o'clock. Been a long time since you had breakfast. Now, if you skip lunch and go on to dinner, you're going to be. If your wife is making dinner at home, you're going to be. You're not going to be sitting in the family room. You're going to be sitting around the kitchen. You're going to be walking past the kitchen, and you're going to be going, "Hey, get, get out of there!" You're going to be picking, and but I just want some of that. Why? Because you're hungry. But if you think about sometimes how you get hungry, all you got to do is tell yourself you're going to fast. 
I'm going to fast tomorrow. I guarantee you, tonight at 11.59, I'll be down in the kitchen. I got to make enough. I got to eat enough to last me. It's amazing how hungry you get when you just think about fasting. That hunger should also be there when you think about righteousness. There ought to be something that stirs inside of you and says, oh, I haven't had any of God for a little while, like about an hour. There's something churning me. It's almost lunchtime in the spirit. I'm going to get myself some righteous lunch. There needs to be a hunger inside of us that wants more of God. I can't remember the time that I walked into the kitchen. My wife was making lunch. She's such a gourmet cook she is. My goodness, it's, 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 it's something. I'm not 400 pounds. You know what I'm saying? But I don't remember ever sitting down to one of those gourmet meals and saying, well, if I don't eat this, sooner or later I'm going to die. <laughs> Gary's laughing. It's true. I've never sat down to, a, to an awesome meal and said, well, you know, I hope it's got enough nutrition in it to sustain me until tomorrow, and, and then I'll have to do this again. I just hate eating. It's just it's a waste of time and money. My wife spends all that time preparing such a good meal, and then in a few moments, it's gone. And yet we forget we can look at living for God like that. Well, I guess I got to pray. Because if I don't, pastor's going to get on my back. I guess I better go to church because I guess you know, it's like something I got to do. The Bible says, forsake not the gathering together. See, well, I guess I better give God some money. I guess the Bible says, where's the hunger? Where does the hunger get a hold of us that say, I can't wait. I got a bunch of, I got a bunch of uh, 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 currency in my office. Now, don't you go breaking in there. <laughs> but I got it for the specific purpose of giving offerings at the church because I don't carry dollars with me. You know, I don't carry currency with me. I carry credit card. You know what I mean? It's just so easy. But I have money in there so I can drop money in there. Why? Because I can't wait to. I say, God, it's time. They're praying for the offering. I can't wait. Why? Because I hunger and thirst after doing right stuff for God. I can't wait to give. It's a right thing. I can't wait to pray. I had my alarm set for 5 o'clock this morning to pray. The alarm never went off. Why? Because I got up at 4.30. I woke up and I looked over and I said, come on, God, you could have given me another half an hour. <laughs> but since you woke me up, I'll get out of here. I went downstairs, made myself a coffee and started praying. And my wife never had to get woken up by the alarm. God just blessed her with a little bit more time. <laughs> Tomorrow's my turn. No, I'm kidding. <clears throat> Man, hungry after righteousness. It tests the value of our superficial uh, uh, professions. We, we say we want some things from God. And yet, when we hunger and thirst after righteousness, it will test you. You love God? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Really. Instead of hungering for righteousness, we can find ourselves hungering for the rewards of righteousness. That came pretty powerfully to me yesterday. Sometimes we do right things just to get the blessing. Sometimes we do right things just to avoid hell. But God said you're supposed to hunger and thirst after righteousness, not because God will bless us, but because it's the right thing to do. We can desire the rewards of righteousness instead of hungering and thirsting after it didn't say hunger and thirst after the rewards of righteousness. It said hunger and thirst after righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and is, and all these things will be added. He, he never said, go ahead, if you want all these things, do this. He said, 
if you hunger and thirst after me, if you seek me first, all that stuff will come. He made it secondary. He didn't make it saying, well, if you want that stuff, then you better do this. That's how our flesh looks at, man, it's hard living for God. No, it's not. It's a blessing to pursue him. It's a blessing to live for God. Uh, Those who hunger and thirst are pronounced blessed because it really is an evidence of a new nature and acceptance with God. If we don't thirst here, we may thirst when it's too late. If we don't thirst like David did in Psalm chapter 42, we will thirst like the rich man did for a drop of water. The Bible says the rich man and Lazarus both died. And the Bible says the rich man, he said, hey, Abraham, would you tell Lazarus to dip his finger in water and touch it to my tongue. We can either thirst now or we'll thirst later. I know this, that if we actually make it there, we'll never thirst again. But there is a place that you can go that you will always thirst because it will never be satisfied. So we can thirst now or thirst later. Is it not better to thirst for righteousness while it's still yet to be gained? than thirst for mercy when there's none to be had. Hunger, one commentator said, hunger is to sustain us and thirst is to refresh us. Interesting. We really don't get involved in breathing, digesting, seeing, hearing, our heart beating. Hunger and thirst are actually two of the natural instincts in the body that we have to do something about. If you're hungry, you can sit there if you want. All that food is going to be outside in a matter of 15 minutes. Now, if you're hungry, you can sit in here if you want. But you saw the little sign, no food or drink in the sanctuary. (laughs) You got to go out there to get it. If you're hungry, your heart will probably continue to beat without you even thinking about it. You're going to breathe without even thinking about it. You're going to hear and see without thinking about it. But if you want to eat, if you're hungry, if you're thirsty, see what I mean? If you're hunger, hungry or thirsty, you have to do something about it. Right. Now, if you're just born, like Owen, mommy had to take him out and feed him because he was hungry. But when you're growing up, you need to go find something for yourself. I know there's a point that I looked at both my kids. Daddy, I'm hungry. I'm like, you know where the refrigerator is? Go get something to eat. You know where the cupboard is? No, I didn't say that when they were six weeks old. But I said it at vacation. Many things in the body, the church body, happen automatically. Most of us didn't get involved in the music this morning. Most of us didn't get involved in studying for the word this morning. Most of us didn't come in and turn the lights on. Most of us didn't worry about the sound system and didn't worry about making sure that the air conditioning was running and didn't worry about setting up the canopy and getting the grills ready. Most of us didn't do any of that, yet it's all here for us. But hungering and thirsting after righteousness is not something I can do for you. It's something that you need to take care of for yourself. And notice, he did not say, they that do, they that have hungered and thirsted after righteousness. He said, they that do hunger now. It is something that doesn't get the ED after it. If you say, well, I used to hungered. I hungered and thirsted. When? Yesterday? Last week? 20 years ago? Did you hunger and thirst after him today? He wants it to be a daily thing. Like food becomes part of us. Now you can take vitamin. You can take vitamin D. Or you can go sit outside in the sun. Or you can eat foods with vitamin D. You can take vitamin C. 
Or you can eat foods with vitamin C in it. But if you eat foods with vitamin C in it, it becomes part of you. If you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you begin to take it in. And righteousness becomes part of us. If you don't hunger and thirst after it, it never becomes part of you. It simply becomes a box that you need to check. I want to hunger and thirst after it so I can engulf it. And it becomes part of me. And it begins to work its way out. Pastor Jan's always said, he said, you don't skin a fish till you get it in a boat. People come here all the time. And you would look at them and say, are they a finished product? No, but neither am I. Right. Amen. Well, I'm not, so, they, I'm not so sure they're dressing holy. First of all, it's none of your business. Right. 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 But secondly, they need to get the Holy Ghost on the inside so that the righteousness continues to work its way on the outside. If we get the holiness on the inside, it will become part of us and work its way out. So please let the Holy Ghost and the pastor deal with that. Hallelujah. Man, some good preaching. <laughs> the other starving of the soul, I'm wrapping up. I'm landing the plane, as Brother William said last Sunday. If we could see our soul as we see other things, it would strike us as one of the saddest things. When a director over in New York, it's a true story, had a house for the receiving of orphaned children, on an inspection it was found that the soup was very thin and there was but very little of it, that the food was most stingily dealt out, and that these children were gradually becoming skin and bones by starvation. The whole city flamed with indignation. They threw open the door of the cell and seized him by the throat and threw him in prison shamefully. But look into our own soul and see how the things that are nearest to God are shut up inside of us while our awakened worldly appetites and passions are fully clothed, feasting daily to their heart's content and are walking up and down the palace of our soul, having their own way. And yet we hear a faint cry in some remote chamber thereof. It is our conscience moaning and pleading for food. And I hear the thundering knock of passions on the door as they say, Hush, be still. Are you never going to sleep? Will you never die? And yet in another corner, I hear the soul crying for food. What ails you? Is the response of our passion. And a bone is thrown in for the soul to gnaw on. Our flesh doesn't typically, typically hunger for too long before we address its needs and its desire. But our soul sits in the corner and cries out. Our soul doesn't want the things of this world. It wants to be saved. It wants to, but it cries out, feed me. Please clothe me. I'm cold and thirsty and hungry, sitting over in the corner. Heavenly things can't support our body. They're not suited to its nature. But neither can earthly things support the soul for the very same reason. You can be absolutely spiritually minded and float above six inches above the ground, but sooner or later you're going to get hungry. Look at Elijah in the cave. I mean, God said, I'm going to have birds bring you food. God knew that even a spiritual prophet would get hungry physically. Even though he prayed, it didn't take care of him forever. There is a hunger deep inside of us that our soul is crying out for righteousness. And if we don't feed it, it will eventually starve. There is an equal for the natural and the spiritual. Seeing, touching, walking, drinking, hungering. Like I alluded to, and the musicians may come 
In Luke chapter 16, you can put it on the board, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Notice this. The rich man also died and was buried. He was dead. This human was dead. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, he could feel, and he saw Abraham. He recognized. And Lazarus, he remembered that old beggar by his gate, so he could remember things in the past. So he not only recognized people, but he remembered what happened in the past. And he cried, he got emotional, and said, he spoke. Abraham, have mercy on me. He realized he needed it. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. He was thirsty. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, son, remember. He said, there's something you already know. Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. Youth, some, some of the people that I grew up with say, man, I'm going to party down in hell. No, you're not. I can't wait to see all my friends down there. Good luck with that. You're going to be all alone. He said, remember in your lifetime you received lots of good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you, so not only will you know your situation, but you will know the situation of the blessed. Abraham said to him, he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this between us, and you, there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from here to there cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from hence. Then he said, I pray. There was a desire inside of him. This is all spiritual. This isn't somebody in limbo that is on their deathbed saying, oh, before I die, please let all of this happen. This is somebody that is already living in a spiritual world. That you would send him to my father's house. Now he's starting to care about his family. For I have five brothers that he may testify unto them, lest they also... I don't want anybody to come here. So please send, send Lazarus to go talk to my five brothers and tell them not to come here. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham. Now he's trying to negotiate. Notice all those attributes. All those attributes were available to somebody that was already dead. So when I said somebody goes on to be with the Lord, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. He saw, he recognized, he touched, he spoke, he thirsted, he desired, he worried about family, he was tormented, he reasoned and he remembered. There's a God-given hunger inside of us that if we pursue it, it will lead to complete satisfaction and blessing. Would you stand with me? Today, I feel God speaking through me and saying, don't spend the rest of your life satisfying the hungers and the thirsts of the flesh. You need to remember that there is a soul, a human spirit living deep down inside of you that is truly hungry and thirsty for the only thing that will satisfy your soul. Because blessed, joyful, Nourished by God's goodness are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who actively seek right standing with God, for they will be completely satisfied. There is a desire inside of us. It has opposition. It has opposition of the devil those that are influenced by the devil 
and also your flesh will do everything it can to stop you from achieving this delight that is only in him. We get off the track once in a while. We take us, we, we, we get off the highway into a wayside. It's at the waysides of life that we fall into trouble. You stay on the highway, you're safe. It was the waysides that afforded the greatest danger. When people chased, they went down to the water. You see, it's at the water where the predators wait. Predators know that. If I just sit by this little pond of water long enough, something's going to come by for a drink. But they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He said, what you're thirsty for, this world will never satisfy. But if you will hunger and thirst after righteousness, how's your appetite today? Righteousness is not a burden. Oh, I know I'm talking to people today. I can't believe I got to do that. If righteousness is a burden, you're not pursuing it. You're simply trying to put up with it. But if you hunger and thirst after it, it will satisfy your soul. There is a revelation waiting for every one of us at the altar. And I invite you to come. Lift up your hands and to say, Jesus, I have somehow misplaced my passions because I can't remember being hungry. I remember duty and I remember obedience. But where did it turn into duty and obedience? Because when I first came, there was a hungering and a thirst after you. Let me fall in love with you again, Jesus, that there would be a deep hungering and a thirsting after righteousness. And Lord, we pray right now because it's a good time, God, that you would bless our fellowship. We pray for all of the food and drink that we will partake of in a few minutes. Let your blessing be upon the hands that have prepared it, God, and bless our fellowship. We ask for your touch. So now that that's done, Lord, let your presence fall. Come on, if you're hungry for God right now, if you're thirsty for him, would you come? Find a place to pray. Find a place to talk to him and say, Lord, would you breathe? Would you, would you just, God, encourage that flame that's in my heart, those embers in my heart. Would you not let those embers go out, but let them become a raging fire in my heart that wakes up in the morning and hungers and thirsts after you. I want to be completely satisfied. I pray for that right now, Lord. Come on, there's a sweet interaction waiting for every one of us. This is not dutiful. It's not obedience. It's simply saying, Lord, I want a hunger. I want something inside of me like a hungry, starving man would go digging through the cupboards. God, there are some people that get so hungry they'll break open a door and get in and try to even steal food. They'll do anything they can to get to it. God, I will search everywhere I can to find because I want to be hungry for you. I want to be hungry. Let's begin to sing. Worship with God.